Dr. Peter Fennick is the internationally renowned expert on death-related phenomenon, or I guess we say phenomena, because there are many of them. They're the they're the experiences of the dying. There are the experiences of the grieving that are watching the dying and those that are survive the death and and how they are coping with their loss and the visions they have are they hallucinations uh, could it be that this this near death experience opens up i don't know some sort of portal uh, and and how do we explain the consistency of these experiences and and what are the inconsistencies of these invisible visitors that come into the deathbed room of those that are passing on. What do we make of that, that the visitations are different in India, say, than they are in the United States? To uh, understand uh, what you're talking about, if I if I run into a problem, I'll, I'll slow you down. But I, I think uh, what I liked so much about what I, when I read the book, and I read almost all of the book, is that... Uh, you 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 start with something that's anecdotal, but then you, you you show a pattern in the anecdote. So let me ask you up front: At what point do do anecdotes become data, where where you collect something that becomes sort of establishes a theme? I think anecdotes become. I think anecdotes are the raw beginnings of science. In other words, you notice something, and then when you look at it, you find a pattern. And then you set up your hypotheses to try and explain the pattern. So in order to look at what happens as we die, we had to get a lot of accounts. And we were enormously lucky in that um, I went on a television show in the UK. And from that, we got nearly 1,000 accounts, 700 from television and about 300 from uh, a newspaper article. So we had a lot of accounts in which we could start looking at anecdotes and then finding the patterns. And, and these were people who personally experienced something as opposed to a family legend. Uh, that's absolutely right. If it was a family legend, it, uh, it went into one of the chapters in the book which deal more with legends. Right. No, th- these were real experiences. You're sitting with your mom or your dad as they're dying. And then they describe exactly what happened. Well, and so let's start there, because in a way we could kind of divide this up into into three categories. The experiences of the dying before death, the experiences of the bereaved during the process before and after death, and then the experiences of uh, a kind of, of witnesses and of other professionals who are kind of going along with the family and what they see in this. There may be even more than that, but, but I, that's kind of where I was going with this. So let's start with the, the, the first group, the, the people who are dying and, and the consistency amongst those people who are passing in having these uh, vis- visitations, seeing visitors or having visions about something that's happening in the room that nobody else can see. Dr. Peter Fennick, neuropsychiatrist and author of the book The Art of Dying, and uh, explaining his expertise. Uh, it would probably take too long here with all of the calls, but uh, suffice it to say, very well qualified to talk about various near death phenomena. And John is in New York on Coast to Coast AM for Dr. Peter Fennick. John? Hello, Ian. Hello, Peter. How are you? Hi. Good evening. I got a question and a little comment here. The first thing, well, we'll reverse that here. Now, do you ever see the Twilight Zone episode when the clock actually died out and the old man died? Uh, no, I never saw that, but uh, go on. Okay. My comment is, now, every, everything is in speculation. Now, when you have your, the way you're practicing and what you're doing exactly... It's it, everything, you, you can have the Pope, you can have Howard Camping, you can have anybody in the world, but it is all speculation. So people got to understand that. I'm not trying to insult your intelligence. I'm not under sure. I don't understand what you're, what you're saying there. I, I, I think you may have missed some of the show then, John. We did talk about the clocks earlier. 
Um, and there is a whole chapter in the book. But when you say when you say speculation, what do you mean by that? Well, what I mean is when he's saying like certain like it could be it could be anything from sleep deprivation. It could be anything. But he just puts certain things in a class that it just it's all speculation. When you die, this happens. It could be a lack of oxygen when you know people see things. Well, the right time. well, let's ask a better question. Let's let's actually ask that. And Doctor Fennick, is it could it just be lack of oxygen? Could it just be you know the somebody sitting on the bed funny? I mean, what 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 can we know about the science of this? Okay, I, I like John's question very much because um, as a scientist, one looks at all a full range of explanations, and it depends uh, really what we are going to talk about. Let's let's talk about first of all science and how you get data. The first stage of science is that you collect reports of a phenomenon. Then the next stage is you set out to see if you can collect these reports reliably. Then the third stage is that you make hypotheses from it. Now, what we're doing at the moment is we're collecting data. In other words, we're seeing what's out there. And what is out there is um, the uh, phenomena, let's say clock stopping or deathbed visions. So people tell us stories. Now, when we did our study, we did it in two bits. We talked to carers of the dying and said, tell us the stories that you've had told to you in the last five years. And so we got a lot of stories in. And then we said to the carers, we're going to come back in a year and tell us all the things that you've seen in the last year and heard repeated to you. So we then went back a year later, and this is called a prospective study, and we looked at what had actually happened during that year. And so that tightens up the data a bit. Now, the next step, and this is John's point, I think, is that supposing somebody is seeing a deathbed vision, uh, could it be due to confusion? Could it be due to um, the fact that because they're dying, their blood chemistry is upset? Could it be because they're not breathing properly, they're anoxic? All these sorts of questions now come into focus. Um, as far as the data that we've had at the moment, these uh, sets of explanations have mainly been discounted by the carers of the dying at the time. And one of the reasons for that is that in deathbed visions, the um, people are extremely clear, they're lucid, and that doesn't go with the confusional state that John is suggesting, but it's, um, it's one of the possibilities, but it doesn't seem to be the correct one at the moment. Now let's go to clock stopping. Do clocks stop? Well, you do exactly the same thing. You do a, a retrospective study and you get your stories. And then you take a number of deaths and you say, um, how many of these people had their clocks stop? And then you actually set it up. And you can set it up with clocks in the room and things like that and see if the clocks stop when you're actually observing them. So there are levels of proof and levels of collecting data. At the moment, we're between the first and the second, and the third's yet to come. 